Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, podcast listeners, and welcome into another story. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and today we have the story of the first settler to leave Appalachia and settle in Middle Tennessee, a man so large and powerful that he could give old Paul Bunyan a run for his money. How big was he, Steve? He was at least 400 pounds of muscle with feet that were, I don't know, 16, 17 inches maybe. I mean, he was a big, big, strong man. How tall was he? Probably close to seven feet. Wow. If I'm not mistaken. Well, yeah. let's hear about this guy. Let's see him find out. Well, the guy we're talking about is a man by the name of Thomas Sharp Spencer. Now, Mr. Spencer was a long hunter, one of the men, including the legendary Daniel Boone, who traveled throughout the backwoods of Appalachia hunting game for meat and furs. Having heard of the rich lands and abundance of big game in the area that would one day surround the city of Nashville, Spencer made the journey to the area from his home in Virginia in the spring of 1776. He brought with him a man named Holiday, and together they established a station at Bledsoe's Lick. It would be interesting to know where his home was in Virginia before he came to Middle Tennessee. Yeah. But that's another story. That summer, Spencer and Holiday hunted and explored the countryside for miles around. In the bottom right next to Bledsoe's Lick, they cleared a few acres of land and planted that Appalachian staple, corn, and thus resulted the first crop of grain planted and harvested in Middle Tennessee. All this wilderness eventually got to Mr. Holiday, though. He became dissatisfied and decided to return home to Virginia. Spencer went with him to the Barrens of Kentucky near present-day Glasgow, Kentucky, along a trail leading back across the mountains. As they were about to go their separate ways, Holiday noticed that he had lost his hunting knife. Well, in those days, knives weren't merely handy in the woods. They were essential to survival. So Spencer, not wanting to send his friend out into the wilderness alone without one, broke his own knife in two and gave him half of it. Holiday, though, was never heard from again, so it appears that the half-knife didn't do him much good on this trip and his journey home. Most folks think that he was killed by a party of Indians as he headed back over the mountains to Virginia. Well, Spencer returned to Bledsoe's Lick. There, instead of building a log cabin or lean-to or some other type of shelter, he decided to let Mother Nature determine where he would lay his head. After looking about, Spencer found an old hollow sycamore tree, which was located in that bottomland. And he promptly moved in for the winter, living there alone just fine. Well, the tree is long gone, but for the time that it remained, the other settlers in the area referred to it as Spencer's House. Now, there's a marker still there near Castilian Springs where the old sycamore tree stood. After a couple of years in the wilderness, Spencer, too, decided to return home to Virginia but returned to the Cumberland country in 1780. While he was there living in that old sycamore, Spencer explored the wilderness from Bledsoe's Lick to the mouth of Red River near present-day Clarksville, Tennessee, in search of choice tracts of land that he might lay claim to at some point in the future, before anyone else did. Because of a misunderstanding as to the preemption law under which he was laboring, preemption meaning the right to claim property under North Carolina law, he thought that by clearing a few acres and building a cabin on each section of 640 acres, an individual would be able to claim as much land as he might desire. As a result, he selected four fine tracts in Sumner County. Three of these were in the area around Castalian Springs, and the fourth was near Gallatin. In 1781, the state of North Carolina, which owned the territory embracing Middle Tennessee at that time, defined by an act its preemption law which allowed only one section to each head of a family or single man who'd reached the age of 21. Spencer was thereby forced to make a choice out of the four tracks that he had previously staked off. He selected the one near Gallatin, and this land has ever since been known as Spencer's Choice. Well, the description of this tract, when granted to Spencer, called for natural boundaries, which were supposed to embrace a section, or 640 acres, but when an actual survey was made many years later, it was found to contain about 800 acres. Well, the records on file in the register's office for Sumner County show that on August 17, 1793, Thomas Spencer conveyed to Stephen Cantrell 
200 acres of the above tract, the consideration being 200 hard dollars. Now, the remainder of the tract was inherited by William Spencer, brother of Thomas Spencer, at the latter's death. Well, now that's the man. Rod, let's take a look at the legend. Well, Thomas Spencer was a man of great physical strength, a giant in his day, well-proportioned, broad-shouldered, huge in body and limb, and weighing nearly 400 pounds. Now, there's many stories, I'm sure some real and some not, but they are told about this giant of a man. On one occasion, shortly after the beginning of the settlement at Nashville, Thomas Spencer was hunting with a fellow long hunter on Duck River in what is now Humphreys County. As evening came on, they had sought a secluded spot where they might build a fire, cook a deer they had killed, and camp for the night. While they were preparing the meal, a party of Indians spotted them. The Braves crept up on the camp until they got within range, then opened fire on the hunters, killing Thomas Spencer's companion. Spencer, who was unharmed, gathered up the man's body and gun, and with the added weight of his own arms and ammunition, dashed into the thick cane and was soon beyond the reach of danger. The Indians, seeing his great strength and agility, and knowing that he had with him two loaded guns, followed at a respectful distance. He succeeded in carrying off and burying the remains of his comrade, after which he returned in safety to French Lick. On another occasion, Mr. Spencer was sick and lying on a blanket by a fire near where two settlers were building a log cabin. He watched them both struggle under the weight of a log, trying in vain to put the end of it in place. After watching this from his sick bed for several minutes, he finally grew tired of seeing them struggle. So he got up from his blanket, walked to the cabin, took hold of the log, and brushing the men aside, threw it in a position with ease, then returned to his sick bed blanket by the fire. Well, Thomas Spencer had the nickname of Bigfoot Spencer, which he got from his large foot, huge even in proportion to his immense body. During his first winter at Bledsoe's Lick, Timothy de Montbrun was conducting a trading station near Nashville and had associated with him a party of French hunters from north of the Ohio River. One morning at dawn, Spencer, who was himself a mighty hunter and who happened to be in that neighborhood, chased a herd of buffalo close by the door of a hut in which one of the hunters was sleeping. It had been raining and the ground was very soft. The sleeping hunter, aroused by the noise of that chase, came out, and upon seeing Spencer's footprint in the mud near the door, became frightened out of his wits, swam across the Cumberland River, and ran north through the wilderness until he reached the French settlement at Vincennes. There, Rod, he told everyone what had happened and swore that he would never go back to a country that was inhabited by such giants. <laughs> <laughs> well, another story relates that Spencer threw a militiaman over a high rail fence to break up a fight at a local muster. When the embarrassed trooper recovered, he begged Spencer to set his horse over the fence also. <laughs> Others characterized him as having the strength of a lion and being stronger than two common men, and as being the stoutest man I ever saw. Spencer said he was afraid to strike another man in anger for fear of killing him. Well, despite these feats of strength, Thomas Spencer had a reputation of being a very kind and gentlemanly soul held in high esteem by the folks who settled in Middle Tennessee. He would wander the wilderness hunting for game to help supply food to the new arrivals to the area when they most needed it, and when not away, he tended to spend his nights at one or another station which needed his help to repel Indian attacks. But all things come to an end, and so did Bigfoot Spencer. In the fall of 1793, Spencer went back to Virginia for the purpose of winding up an estate and collecting an inheritance he was due. On his way back on April 1, 1794, between Knoxville and Nashville, at a place known as Spencer's Hill near the headwaters of the Caney Fork River, Spencer was riding ahead of his party alone, as he often did. Just as he reached the top of the hill, he was fired upon by a band of Indians who were waiting to ambush the party. Thomas Spencer was instantly killed, ending the life of a real Paul Bunyan. Now, I love stories like this. It's sad, too, the way it ends there, because, you know, here it was. They were almost, in a way, scared of him this entire time. But, you know, here he was riding out all by himself, and then, boom, it's over. That's right. Well, you know, he feared nobody. The Indians feared him. But mm -hmm. this band of Indians got him and yeah. cut his life short. Mm. And that's the story of Thomas Sharp Spencer, also known as Bigfoot Spencer, 
another story that makes up the history of this place we call home. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for listening. Till next we meet, so long, everybody. We'll be right back.